Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the, seven, the Sabbath School Essences prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Matthew. Uh, this is lesson number five in that series entitled, The Seen and the Unseen War. Hmm, I wonder what that would be about. It's lesson for April 30 of 2016, and we hope that you have your Bible handy, but we would like to ask you at this moment to close your eyes and have a word of prayer with us. Our kind and loving Father, as we have privilege to open your word now and to talk about you, we ask that all those who are able to share in their thoughts in our conversation may be blessed by the wonderful teachings in this portion of Scripture is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> God asks us in this lesson to step back for a moment, to, to, to maybe take the, you know, the helicopter view of what's going on in our world. We know that there are invisible realities like x-rays and radio waves and wireless communications. Uh, we're, we're very familiar with them. We use our radios and we use our televisions and we use our cell phones, etc. It shouldn't be a surprise to us then that angels, both good and evil, and God himself can and do exist and exert influences on us and our friends every day. There's an interesting couple of verses that our lesson opens up with. They're found in Matthew 11, verses 11 and 12. I assure you that John the Baptist is greater than anyone who has ever lived, but the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. So that's the, that's the background. From the time John preached his message until this very day, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violent attacks and violent men try to seize it. Hmm. What is that trying to say? Uh, the NIV puts it this way. Is it true that the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it? The New Living Translation says, Thy, The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people have been attacking it. Certainly we would recognize that there may be things about the spiritual world that we do not understand. Ellen White puts it this way, this way, The very humblest forms of life present a problem that the wisest of philosophers is powerless to explain. Everywhere wonders beyond our ken. Should we then be surprised to find that in the supernatural world also there are mysteries that we cannot fathom? The difficulty lies solely in the weakness and narrowness of the human mind. God has given us in the scriptures sufficient evidence of their divine character, and we are not to doubt his word because we cannot understand all the mysteries of his providence. Steps to Christ 106 and 107. Well, it's interesting that the word biazzo from the that's found in this verse, can mean either forcefully advancing or suffering violence. You might wonder how it could have those two meanings. But. And then the word biastes, another version of that, word, of that root, can mean forceful or eager man or violent man. So one possible explanation goes something like this. In Matthew 11, 12, used in the passive, but with the middle meaning, that is, the kingdom of God, biazetai, uh, is sought with eagerness, haste. It is not carefully thought of as to its consequences, which may not be pleasant, such as persecution by one's very own household. Jesus says, I'm going to separate fathers and children, didn't he? And the middle voice, meaning that one professes himself in to seize the kingdom with his own energy, as if the kingdom could be had as something to be grasped. We see this today as people eagerly and flippantly come forward to, quote, accept Christ, without having experienced repentance of sin or having counted the cost of their acceptance. That's uh, an explanation in the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the New Testament. Jesus warned us that our progress in the Christian way as individuals and as a group will not always be peaceful. Matthew 10.34, Revelation 5, Af and Micah 2.13. Adventists have uh, given a interpretation of those verses similar. Um, look at these. Some have argued that the most likely interpretation of Matthew eleven twelve 12 is to apply the most common uses of beazomai 
typically positive or best days, typically negative, giving us this interpretation. The kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing with holy power and magnificent energy that has been, pushed, push, has been pushing back the frontiers of darkness. And while this is happening, violent or rapacious men have been trying to plunder it. So what's all that mean? Surely these ideas suggest that we are living in the midst of a great controversy, sometimes called a cosmic conflict. We make choices every day based on what we choose to do, listen to, watch, or say. Everything is either colored by the love of God or tinged with the ideas of Satan. Although we recognize that God is all-powerful, it is still true that here on planet Earth, Satan may at times seem to be winning. Can you think of some examples? I don't think he's winning. <laughs> I can't get any examples. <laughs> you can't give any examples? <laughs> Dark a, ages. Yeah. A number of times in the Bible itself, Matthew 12, 25 to 29, Isaiah 27, 1, 1 John 5, 19, Romans 16, 20, Genesis 3, 14 to 19, Ephesians 2, 2, 6, 11 to 12, um, it talks about him as the prince of this world. It talks about him. Even Jesus calls, uh, said, the whole world is under the rule of the evil one. Doesn't that sound like Satan's winning? First John five nineteen. But we know... Say something like the, the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages is over with. Well, so, we, we're, not saying, we're, not like saying that, we're not saying that, Je that Satan is going to be the ultimate winner. We're just saying that sometimes it seems like he's the winner. Seems like the winner. Okay. We know that ultimately, and I quote, God, our source of peace, will crush Satan under your feet. Speaking to God himself, or to the Christians, Romans 16, 20. Adventists have become quite familiar with the idea of the great controversy. One, at, at least one contemporary non-Adventist theologian describes what he calls a warfare worldview. So now we had another name we can add to our list. Great controversy, cosmic conflict, Warfare worldview. Well, did Adventists sort of come up with this idea of a great controversy? No. No? Who came up with it? Scriptures. Ellen White is the one who brought it to our attention. Without her, the Seventh-day Adventist Church would be missing its core beliefs, and it is doubtful if we would be in existence today. That's my personal testimony. Can you identify the work of Satan in the cosmic conflict in your own life? Remember that to Satan, this is a life or death battle. He knows that ultimately he will lose, but if he can be successful in getting us to join his side so that none of us actually understands the great controversy and stands firmly on God's side, he can delay the day. How successful has he been at doing that? Gary, you're the one to answer that question. How long has it been since Jesus died? About 2,000 years. Does that sound like Satan's had some success? No. Well, you think God 2, was... 2,000 years might be a blink of an eye to God. I think he would have liked to have come a long time ago if he could have worked it out. I think from our perspective, if you look into history, as far as we can go back, there's been at least 2,000 wars. No. right up yeah. to the present time. So, I mean, he's been stirring the pot a long time. Well, that, those verses we just quoted fall in the context of a story about John the Baptist. Do you remember what happened? Jesus is preaching to a bunch of people, healing them, you know, the usual activities. When Jesus finished giving, I'm, I'm turning now to Matthew 11, starting with verse 1. When Jesus finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he left that place and went off to teach and preach in the towns nearby. When John the Baptist heard in prison about... So where's John now? He's already been in prison for a while. Mm -hmm. And what two events... When John was in prison, and was, was arrested and put in prison, what did Jesus do? Left Jerusalem and Judea. He began his ministry in Galilee, didn't he? Well, when John heard about what Jesus was doing, what Christ was doing, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus. Tell us, they asked Jesus, are you the one John said was going to come or should we expect someone else? Has John the Baptist lost his faith? 
No, let's let's yeah. recheck our hypothesis. Let's work through this again. Let's make sure that we're right. Yeah. That was what he was saying. I see. Well, I think where he was, he probably wasn't getting any up-to-date news. He wanted to know what was going on. What other kind of news was he getting from the people who lived in the house upstairs? Probably bad. Well, could it be possible that it wasn't going to his expectations? Yes. It's possible. Well, I mean, and think about it. Now, just think about it for a moment. What were the Jews expecting the Messiah to do? Rise up a great army and bring Jerusalem and Israel back to the glory of Solomon. Keep and the Romans out. Get rid of and Romans. John must have had some of those ideas in his head. And he said, here's the Lamb of God. What is that supposed to mean? And now Jesus is healing people and he's doing a lot of preaching, but where's the army? You know? So, so Jesus spends the whole day. He doesn't just immediately answer the, the disciples, who, John's disciples who came to him. He spends the whole day healing people and teaching and doing all this kind of stuff. And so they observed all of this. And then what did Jesus do? He said, go back and tell John what you are hearing and seeing. The blind can see, the lame can walk, those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases are made clean, the deaf hear, the dead are brought back to life, and the good news is preached preach to the poor. How happy are those who have no doubts about me. He didn't mention the army. It would have been interesting to follow those people back to tell John that because his reaction mm -hmm. would tell you what really happened there. He might just, his eyes might light up and say, oh, I see, mm -hmm. or something else, or maybe he, he knew and he was just telling his disciples to, you know, to, that <laughs> go find out for yourself. You know? While John's disciples were leaving, Jesus spoke about him to the crowds. When you went out to John in the desert, what did you expect to see? A blade of grass bending in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed up in fancy clothes? People who dress like that live in palaces. Tell me, what did you go out to see? So he was asking him, what were your expectations? Mm -hmm. And maybe even John was confronting his expectations too. You expect to see a prophet? Yes, indeed, you, but you saw much more than a prophet, for John is the one of whom the scripture says, God said, I will send my messenger ahead of you to open the way for you. I assure you that John the Baptist is greater than anyone who has ever lived. But the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. From the time John preached his message until this very day, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violent attacks, and violent men tried to seize it. And that's the... the uh, passage we discussed earlier. There sure were some prophets though that had bigger fireworks than John did. Yeah. But I guess that was <laughs> important. Mm -hmm. So who is responsible for putting John in jail? Um, is it Herod? Is Herod. Herod. Yeah. yeah. And what, why, why did he put John in jail? I was pointing out some of the weaknesses and the failings on the part of Herod, wasn't he? Yeah, and what was one of those big marrying, weaknesses? Marrying his... Uh, Taking his brother's uh, wife away and marrying her, along with her evil daughter. And how much of that do you think Jesus, John understood? I mean, he's, he's probably living in a prison that's attached to the palace. Do you think he hears about some of the stuff that's going on? He knows perfectly well that the woman who lives upstairs or somewhere not very far away is doing everything she possibly can to get him killed, right? So why would he do that? Was that a... Why what, would good he, was it, what good was it to call Herod out on that? Mm -hmm. and because Jesus didn't do that, did he? Oh. You don't think he called out the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, not Herod. I don't think he did anything oh, to yeah. Herod. In, in Luke, he, he, he describes Herod as that old fox. Yeah. Well, that's not, that's not any worse. I mean, that isn't as bad as telling what well, kind of a, sure. what 
what John was telling him he was doing. Yeah. Well, Satan suggested, and, and we know from, from history, that, uh, from the story, that when John was finally beheaded, what did Jesus do? He left Galilee. And Jesus spent pretty much all the rest of his ministry, except for until up to the final journey toward Jerusalem, in territories outside of the Jewish territory. You think Wasn't he was safe. scared? Hmm? You think he was scared? No. He was doing a couple of things. Yeah. One of the main things he was doing was trying to concentrate his final teachings on his disciples. Instead of spending so much time just healing and teaching other people, he said, I need to really work with these disciples. He did that for six months. But why would he take off? Because it's, when he went to the other place, didn't he still have a lot of healing to do when he went to Perea or wherever? Well, he did. I mean, he was, he was never far away. And people came to him out there, but the Jews didn't have authority out there. And they couldn't arrest him. See, if he'd, been, if he'd gone to Jerusalem and carried on his usual Galilean kind of ministry, a Perean kind of ministry in Jerusalem, they would have arrested him on the spot. Or at least attempted to, which would have been a distraction to the yeah. teaching that Jesus. And they would have figured out a way sooner or later to arrest him. Well, so I think that's the key there is distractions. Uh, the thought, uh, God can keep protect. Uh, Jesus wasn't going to go away from his protection until the appropriate time, but it was a, would have been a distraction from the teaching that he was trying to convey Did, to the disciples. Didn't Jesus teach that we are we're supposed to visit uh, people in prison? Yeah, but he didn't visit John. <laughs> he didn't, did he? Mm -mm. But he, he, knew, he knew he hadn't finished his work. That's one, one of the reasons yeah. he went. And well, throughout human history, humans have engaged in warfare. For one reason or another, unfortunately, often for religious reasons, wars have caused plundering, pillaging, and slaughtering of one group by another. Catherine Tate, the daughter of Bertrand Russell, wrote these words about her father and his reaction to the prospects of World War I. So he's writing as there's building up animosities toward World War I. He had grown up with an optimistic Victorian belief in automatic progress, with the confidence that the whole world would, in its own good time, follow the wise course of the English from ancient brutality to civilized self-government. Then suddenly, he found his own beloved compatriots dancing in the streets at the prospect of slaughtering great numbers of fellow human beings who happened to speak German. Well, in most human wars, of course, no one knows for sure exactly what the outcome is going to be. Will this side win or will that side win? But in our cosmic conflict, we already know who's going to win, don't we? Yeah. So, do you want to join the winning side or do you want to join the losing side? So, everybody joins the winning side, right? <laughs> That's how they start out. <laughs> So why, why did you ask that question? Because... Because I wanted you to think. That... Well, I'm trying to think why you asked it. <laughs> to think, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, would, I mean, if you just put that... If, if people didn't know you were talking about the Great Controversy and just said, there's a war going on here and you, you have to join one side or another, but I can tell you up front who's going to win. Which side would you want to join? If, if you know, just... Put, it, put those very stark terms. Would you say, well, let me join the winning side? Well, Who wants to join be, the losing side in the war? That would be, but um, how do you explain but, all the people that are, that are lost? Well, that's my question. You're, you're trying to get ahead of me here. Okay. You know, put simply, put just starkly like I did, you would have thought everybody would say, well, sure, let's join the winning side, right? So why do the majority of people join the losing side? What are the issues in the Great Controversy? Isn't that a, a huge question? So how do we make that choice? I mean, it can't be just a simple, well, yeah, I, I want to be on the winning side. I mean, if you could just, you know, just say, yeah, march through a door or march into a room or something and say, which side do you want to be on? I want to be on the win winning side. Okay, bye. That was all there were to it. Wouldn't everybody choose to be on the winning side? But that's more, there's more to it. So what is the more? That's what we want to come to. So what is the Great Controversy all about? God's fairness and love. 
Okay. Throughout the universe, when Satan was fighting that for a long time, as still is. Basically, who God is. Okay. Whether God's been lying to us yes. all this time. Mm -hmm. Is God a liar? Can he be trusted? Yep. Does, and, and what are the basic questions? We'll start off with some simple ones right from the beginning of Genesis. Does sin lead to death? You remember what Jesus, what did God say in Genesis 2.17? Except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree, that is, commit sin, rebel against God. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay? So, that's one side. What is the other side? Or is that, that's God's statement. Or is that a lie, as Satan claimed? And remember what it says in Genesis 3. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? He tries to really exaggerate here. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. So what's Satan saying about God right up, right up front? God is a liar. Lying to God has been lying to you. Another question. Lucifer back in heaven wanted to be on an equality with Jesus. So, is Jesus really divine or is he just another angel, like Michael the archangel? And therefore no greater than Lucifer himself? Well, what did Jesus say about that question? Do you remember? John 10, 18. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right or power or authority to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. Which creature that you know about has the right to, or the power to lay down his life and to take it back again? Anybody here want to demonstrate that for us? Not going to happen, right? And Satan knows perfectly well he can't do it. Um... Well, there's lots of verses in the Bible. Hebrews 2.14, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 27, Revelation 12, 12, and 20, 10 that suggest that Christ will be the ultimate victor in this war. Satan even knows that he only has a little time left. Revelation 12, 12. And he will ultimately be destroyed in the lake of fire. How would you like to read that about yourself in the Bible? Just as Christ and Satan battled over the minds of angels in heaven and Satan lost, the same basic conflict is happening on earth today, except who's, who's making choices today? Humans. That's us. Remember that by beholding we become changed. So what are we exposing ourselves to each day? What are we doing, watching, listening to, even thinking? How is that impacting us and slowly modifying our characters and our personalities? Well, what are some, very, some of the most subtle ways in which Satan deceives Christians and leads them astray? One of his favorite temptations is whatever it involves. Just, yeah, try it once. It's not going to hurt you. And when you try it once, then what? Two things. One, it's a lot easier to do it the second time. But two, Satan will come back to say, well, you know, you're such a terrible sinner. Look what you did. God, there's no way God's going to accept you back. Well, it's true that we're not going to be able to recover from any sin on our own, right? So what do we have to do? We have to go to Christ. We have to go to God. And we ask for, have to ask for forgiveness. But if we're willing to take the time and the effort to make constant choices in the right direction, we can return to God. So, what about this great controversy idea now? Let's talk a little more about it. What do we know about it? Well, I would suggest that very few Christians, even few Seventh-day Adventists, understand the details of the cosmic conflict of the great controversy as spelled out in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen White. 
We need to understand, however, that it was not Ellen White who first suggested these kinds of ideas. And for those of you who would like to see more on this, I would suggest you go to our website. It's www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Let me say it, spell that again, www.theox dot O-R-G. Go to the section called Teacher's Guides, then look for General Topics, and look for the handout, The Great Controversy Described in Scripture. And you'll find several pages that talk about how much great controversy stuff there is right in Scripture. And there's not, not nearly all of the, of the great controversy in Scripture is covered in that short handout. While many portions of Scripture are hard to understand, in fact, might easily be very misunderstood without a knowledge of the great controversy and the role of Satan. So, the question I asked to Gary a little while ago, why are we still here so long after Jesus won the victory on the cross? Are we winning that victory? Why, after winning that victory, why didn't Jesus come back to this earth and destroy the devil? Wouldn't that have solved the problem? No? Why not? Evil has to run its course. Show them how really bad it is. Apparently, we haven't seen enough of it. We haven't seen enough? Boy. It's pretty hard to imagine it getting much worse than it is now. But then again, we know that the whole world, except for one family, was wiped out once, weren't they? What are the real issues in the Great Controversy? Could you spell them out and give a few examples? You're not a bunch of ignorant people, I know that. You've heard these things before. <laughs> Who can be trusted? We've already mentioned that. Okay. The battleground of the great controversy was in the minds of God's creatures throughout the universe. After the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the rest of the universe saw clearly the issues and have rejected all of Satan's claims against God and his character and government. So, we're going to suggest that this is not just a battle between good and evil, as many Christians would, would suggest. This is a case where Satan has made many very serious charges against God. And if God were actually the kind of person Satan has claimed him to be, you wouldn't want to have anything to do with God. He's said God is arbitrary and vengeful and vindictive and, and a tyrant and an unfair judge, and he's just made all kinds of claims against God. So if God were like any of those things, I mean, would you want to live with him? How many churches uh, repeat what, what those uh, yeah. charges? So it turns out now, at this point in history, uh, what's going on? Well, 1 Corinthians 4.9 puts it this way. For it seems to me that God has given, this is Paul, of course, talking to his Corinthian friends, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public, as a spectacle, that's the Greek word is theater, for the whole world of angels and of humanity. So who's watching this spectacle, this theater? The whole universe. The entire universe. Okay, so the next thing we're suggesting is that the real great controversy as presented in Scripture... And another great example of that is Ephesians 1, 8 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 or 8 up to 10, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, I'm sorry, 19 and 20, another example of, of that same idea. But the issues have not changed. The angels and the beings and the rest of the universe needed the answers that were provided by the life and death of Jesus just as much as we do. We talked about quite a bit about that last quarter. But they saw all the details of the life and death of Jesus and understood almost everything that was involved and Satan can no longer be successful in deceiving them. So, what was it that saved them from all kinds of trouble? Saves them now that prevents Satan from attacking them and deceiving them? The life and death of Christ. And what did they learn through the life and death of Christ? God was, yeah. God God's is. one and Satan's not going to 
Okay. Be successful. In, in the Garden of Eden and before, God was right, Satan was wrong. Yeah. God is not a liar. Mm -hmm. God has told the truth. Okay. I'm going to take several quotations from Ellen White here, if you will allow me, and see if we can just see what she says about some of these issues. When the last steps of Christ's humiliation were to be taken, when the deepest sorrow was closing about his soul, now she's talking about as he's headed for the Garden of Gethsemane now, he said to his disciples, The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The prince of this world is judged. Now shall he be cast out. With prophetic eye, Christ, now notice this, with prophetic eye, Christ traced the scenes to take place in his last great conflict. He knew that when he should exclaim, It is finished, all heaven would triumph. His ear caught the distant music and the shouts of victory in the heavenly courts. Now think about this. Jesus has what kind of a relationship to the angels in heaven? He's their creator. He's their creator. He's their king, just as he's our king. He's their leader. He's the most beloved person there, right? They all wish they could be more like him, right? And it says here that when he dies, they're going to be doing what? Rejoicing. Does that make any sense? Well, he says it is he said it is finished. Let's see if we can find out what that's all about. That quotation from was Desire of Ages six seventy nine, paragraph one. Jesus was aware in advance that he would face that incredible struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. There's probably no better place to find the issues in the Great Controversy spelled out than in the chapters Calvary, where it talks about his crucifixion, and especially the chapter It is Finished and the book Desire of Ages. We're going to pick out just a few notes from those two chapters that will give us a clue about the issues in the Great Controversy. Desire of Ages. I'm going to start with 756, paragraph 2. Suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross, and in clear trumpet-like tones that seemed to resound throughout creation, Jesus cried, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, before, just before he said that, what other words did he say about the relationship between himself and the Father? He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah, but while he's hanging on the cross, okay. what? Hmm. he addresses his Father, and what does he say? The Forgive work them. you gave me to do. I finished the work which you gave me to do. That's also true. That was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But on the cross he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But yet here he says, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Well, a light encircled the cross, and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. Now remember, for hours it's been pitch black. You cannot see anything. And all of a sudden, a light appears over the cross, shining right on Jesus himself. A, glory, a light shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head upon his breast and died. So, let's think about this for a minute. We, we all believe, I think, unless someone wants to disagree with me, that by his life and his death, Jesus won the great controversy. Are we all, uh, on that, we, we all agree with that? Yeah. Have you thought about how, how crazy that sounds, that you win the war by dying? Well, we that process was uh, demonstrating that God was righteous, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. Well, God had said, if you sin, kills. Now, Jesus didn't sin, but this suffers collateral damage, so to speak. We have been told that we are saved by faith, right? There's righteousness by faith, there's salvation by faith, you know, all those expressions. How does that work? Well, look at the case of Jesus. If we substitute the word healed uh -huh. instead of uh, salvation or saved, the, and what needs healing the most? Is it my, if I had pancreatic cancer, do I need if healing for that, or I need my thinking about God changed? Yeah. That's what needs healing. Yeah. Well, in those dreadful hours, talking now about the cross, Jesus had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given to him. Given to him. 
So how does he, how does he re exercise his faith? Look at dropping down in my quotation there. By faith he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. So his faith, based on his evidence from his previous experiences with God, made him a victor. Is that any kind of example we should learn from? Well, what, what, what made Jesus the, the uh, pained him the most while he was here on earth? Remember, he says, "I came to my family and they didn't recognize me." Yeah. If, if people rejected him, the, the religious leaders were trying to get rid of him because, uh, and yet he was the clearest picture of, yeah. of, of God that they had could ever possibly ask for. And that was uh, what I understand, the misrepresentation on the part of the religious pious frauds yeah. called priests and scribes and Pharisees, which he ultimately co were the record of condemnation in Matthew 23. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what... Let me, let me raise the, the other question again. Why were the angels rejoicing when Jesus died? And I quote, Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Savior's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. Jesus is dead. Satan is alive and well. How can we call that a victory for Jesus? To the angels in the unfallen worlds, the cry, It is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them, as well as for us, that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Now, among Christian circles, almost everyone will say, Jesus died for our sins. Now that's true. He died for you. He died for me. There's no question about that. But there's more. Say, you could say he died for sinners from the standpoint that he died because of sin. Mm -hmm. But he didn't die to pay a penalty or something oh, like well, that. That's a pagan story. concept that is pervasive through most of religions. Okay. The angels in the unfallen world, to, to the angels in the unfallen words, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Did they need their sins forgiven? Nope. So what did the death of Christ do for them? It answered the questions that, that arose on the part when the adversary accused God of being arbitrary, vengeful, and so on and so forth. Going on, Desire of Ages 758, not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. So what does one of the things that Jesus accomplished by his life and his death? Expose the adversary for what he was. Expose the adversary. The arch apostate had so closed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. So in addition to dying for our sins, Jesus is also revealing the truth about Satan, right? Well, is this, a, is this a battle over power? James 2.19 tells us when the devils think about God's power, they, it tremble, they tremble with fright, right? So it's not really a battle about power. God could have destroyed, and I now desire of ages 7.59, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can ta cast a pebble to the earth. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. So what else are we learning here? Compelling power, force, is only to be found where? In the part of the adversary and false religions. Yeah. When they say the force awakens, there's a movie out, the force awakens. That's fascism. That is the antithesis of the way God runs his universe. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of Satan's claims against God? Look at this. It's just unbelievable to me. It was, and now I'm, I'm coming, reading a couple paragraphs from, uh, this is from Desire of Ages 761. It was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security. And in the councils of heaven, so, first of all, God is trying to accomplish what? He doesn't want just a temporary solution. He, he doesn't want to just wipe out the devil. He says, I want to establish the truth so clearly and so convincingly that there's no, not going to be any question about it for the rest of eternity, right? It can't use force to accomplish that. 
it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his system of government. So if you want to know the superiority of God's government, you need to contrast it with whose government? Satan's government. He had claimed, Satan had claimed that these principles, his principles, were superior to God's principles. How would we figure that out? Time was given for the working of Satan's principles that they might be seen by the heavenly universe. So who's watching all this? Once again, the heavenly universe. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. Not only a murderer of an ordinary person, but a murderer of who? He tried to murder Jesus. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, after that, his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from, from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. <coughs> the last link of sympathy between Satan and his heavenly world and the heavenly world was broken. So, what is the next thing that Christ accomplished? By revealing the truth about Satan, he did what? He convinced the onlooking universe that they never wanted to have anything to do with him ever again, right? So, having accomplished that, shouldn't the war have been over? You'd have thought so, right? So what's God still waiting for? Who is it that's still in ignorance? It's us. Yeah. Most of humanity. We have to be given the opportunity to see the issues and make a cho the choices just like the angels did. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. I quote again from Desire of Ages 761. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, and women of course, Satan's existence must be continued. Satan continues to exist for our benefit? Man as well as angels must see the contrast between the Prince of Light and the Prince of Darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. And that's called the judgment. Yes. We judge between God and the devil. Right. Well, what other claims did Satan make? In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Okay? If you're a sinner, that's all, it's all over for you. God can't forgive you. It wouldn't be fair. That's Satan talking. He says, God, you're not fair. Yep. Look at those sinners down there. Mm -hmm. You're not fair to me. And or I'm talking Every about sin that. must meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. Well, there's several, a bunch of claims by Satan. Okay? When men broke the law of God and defied his will, that would be in the Garden of Eden, Satan exulted. He was ecstatic. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed, the man could not be forgiven. Because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from heaven, Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be just, he urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. Look at all those incredible claims by the devil. Understanding the character of God, Knowing his goodness, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will. And where was Satan when he was doing that, making those choices? In heaven. In Lucifer. He's standing next to the throne of God. And in, in the face of that incredible love, he chooses to be selfish. Wow. There was no more that God could do to save him. But man was deceived. His mind was darkened by Satan's sophistry. The height and depth of the love of God he did not know. 
for him there was hope of, in a knowledge of God's love. By beholding his character, he might be drawn back to God. Desire of Ages 7, 61, paragraph 5. So we can be drawn back to love God by doing what? By seeing God's character, by learning the truth about him. Well, what have we learned about Satan's claims since that day until this? By his life and his death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy his mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. Who proved that God's law could be perfectly obeyed? Jesus. Jesus. He, he did it all through his life. Then the end will come. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. Satan and all who have joined with him, joined him in a rebellion, will be cut off. And how will they be cut off? What happens to sinners in the end? Just let them go. Yeah. Sinners will ultimately cut themselves off from God, the only source of life. And Ellen White goes on to say, This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life, and when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God and thus cuts himself off from life. What do sinners do to themselves? Cut themselves off. Cut themselves off from life. He is alienated from the life of God, Christ says. All they that hate me love death, Ephesians 4.18 and Proverbs 8.36. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him, Now we talked earlier in our discussion, we said, you know, if you just put the choice out there, just simply say, who wants to be on the winning side, who wants to be on the losing side, what would almost everybody say? We want to be on the winning side, right? But what happens? By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Desire of Age 764, paragraph 1. So is God, does God want to destroy them? Is he waiting to get his pound of flesh, as some have said? Is he just waiting to pour out his wrath on sinners? No. So why has he waited so long? I just want there to be any doubt about where it all leads to. Ellen White goes on. She covers so many things in this one chapter. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin and woe. Desire of Ages 764.2 Well, what do you think? Will the issues eventually become completely clear? Yeah. Now the truth about Satan's claims and God's character have been clearly demonstrated. She goes on, but not so when great controversy shall be ended. Then the plan of redemption, having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all created intelligences. The precepts of his law are seen to be perfect and immutable. Then sin has made manifest its nature, Satan, his character. Then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will and, whose heart, and in whose heart is his law. Well then might the angels rejoice as they look upon the Savior's cross, for they did not then understand all, though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain, and that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe was made eternally secure. Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, It is finished. Is it easier for us to see now in light of these few paragraphs why the angels were rejoicing? Wow. 
Well, it's very clear, I think, I hope, that the devil lost the core battle in the great controversy. But he's not going to give up easily. He is insane in his battle against God. Ellen White says, The devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That's, of course, Revelation 12, 12. The antitypical land of promise is just before us, and Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. Gospel Herald, August 1, 1910. From the beginning, it has been Satan's studied plan to cause men to forget God, that he might secure them to himself. Hence, he has sought to misrepresent the character of God, to lead men to cherish a false conception of him. The Creator has been presented to their minds as clothed with the attributes of the Prince of Evil himself. What has Satan said about God? He's arbitrary, severe, unforgiving. Satan hopes that we will fear God, we will shun Him, we will hate Him. And how many people have down through the years? Satan hoped to so confuse the minds of those whom he had deceived that they would put God out of their knowledge. Then he would obliterate the divine image in man and impress his own likeness upon the soul. Do you think there's any people walking around who have the likeness of Satan impressed upon their souls? He would imbue men with his own spirit and make them, make them captive according to his will. It was by falsifying the character of God we talked about all the claims he made against God, and exciting distrust of him, in other words, don't, don't trust God, that Satan tempted Eve to transgress. Even the covenant people whom God had chosen to preserve in the world the knowledge of himself had so far departed from him that they had lost all true conception of his character. Christ came to reveal God to the world as a God of love, full of mercy, tenderness, and compassion. The thick darkness with which Satan endeavored to enshrine, enshroud the throne of deity was swept away by the will's redeemer and the Father was again manifested to men as the light of life. So, having said all that, do you think that um, you could spell out a few of the false claims of Satan and some of the corrections that God has made to those false claims? I hope those of you out there will have an opportunity to take your great controversy and your desire of ages especially and read those chapters and review those causes. Just a couple more words. We have one monumental task that we need to accomplish before he can come again. And interestingly enough, Ellen White puts it in these words. These, uh, that previous one, by the way, was from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 738, uh, paragraph 1 to paragraph 4. This one is from Education, page 190, paragraph 2. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the Word as a whole and to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy. What are we supposed to learn by studying the Bible? About the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy. Who are the two, nature, who are the two natures contending for supremacy? God and Satan. We've just read a whole bunch of passages that talk about how Satan works and about how God responds. Um, and that are contending for supremacy. And we, should, we need to learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see, this is all of us, we should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience. How in every act of life, he himself or she herself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives. And how whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. So where does the great controversy take place? Between our ears, right? This is the battlefield. This is the battleground. And how does Satan try to suggest his ideas to our minds? Does he have, does he have the ability to get into our minds? If we allow him. He did it 
in heaven, and he did it. You know, has been doing it for a long, since the creation. Yeah. Of this earth. I mean, by the avenues of the soul. What are the avenues of the soul? Vision, hearing, senses. all our senses, touch, taste, and smell. Right. By every means possible, Satan is there constantly trying to. I mean, do I need to be graphic? Think of all the temptations that we face every day, even driving down the freeway, right? We know that the great controversy or the cosmic conflict began when Satan, then Lucifer, standing beside the throne of God in heaven, rebelled. Again, every time I think about that, it just blows my mind. It will not end until Satan and all who sympathize with him will have destroyed themselves by separating themselves um, from God. Every day we need to fix our attention on Jesus and allow him to guide our lives. So in a world like ours, how do we fix our attention on Jesus as opposed to all the temptations that are constantly bombarding us from every side? Yeah? Bible reading. Yeah. Bible reading? Read the even these materials we've been talking about from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, some of these books, thinking about God, praying. We also need to practice telling what we believe to others. Why is that important? To be, able, <coughs> to be able to do that properly, it sets it in our own minds. Exactly. All you have to do is figure out how well you know a subject, try to teach it to somebody else. So every day we need to fix our attention on Jesus and allow him to guide our lives. Only in this way will it be possible for us to attain the victory he is offering for us. In this lesson, we have covered an incredible amount of very significant material. The issues in the great controversy, talking about both sides, Satan's side, talking about God's side, and understanding that this great controversy is not just good versus evil. It are its very specific accusations of Satan against God and God's very specific answers to those accusations down through history, through, as recorded in Scripture, but not only that, specifically in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you and he died for me, but he also died to answer the most important questions that have ever been raised in the history of our world, and I hope you understand those answers. Our kind and loving Father, as we have taken a lot of material put it together in this lesson. Your words, not ours. We hesitate to try to put it in our words because we know you say it so much better. But we have seen that there is a massive war going on. And it's a part of our lives every day. Help us to see our way clearly to the right side, to stay on your side and to remain on the winning side is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.